Many years have passed since this grand old duchess had a timetable or a destination. She's one of countless steam locomotives put out of work by what's called progress. The men who saved her dream of building a monument for all Australians of the time when steam was king. But they know that a locomotive that can't move can't live. What they needed was a line. Years of searching ended on the branch line which runs inland from Coffs Harbour, up the Great Dividing Range to the town of Dorigo. Many said they couldn't have picked a worse line, that it should never have been built in the first place. It had taken 700 men in a decade to lay the steepest, windiest, most expensive 60 kilometres of railway line in the state. It was equally the most costly line to keep open. For 50 years, the New South Wales government persevered with landslips and trees burying the line and floods washing away bridges and embankments. Well, here we go again. These blokes are right. Just you come here, Dennis, and hold up. One, two, three. Finally, in the mid-1970s, they closed it. But its beauty and colourful history, these men couldn't pass by. Their dream is to create one of the finest rail museums in the world. The line would be perfect if they could tame it. Hey! Sit down on this end. That's good. Just take it out of They would say they're just ordinary men, but they share a special brand of determination and have skills to match. What do you, what do you reckon, Greg? Uh, I'll have to tie it up and find out where it's bent. It's pretty bad, isn't it? Yeah, it, must, it must have hit that with a force, I reckon. In everyday life, many are railway workers. Some drive electric commuter trains or diesel locomotives and spend their holidays here. Others have given up their jobs altogether to sweat every day on the line. Come along towards me. Yeah, there. Mark that spot. It took years of negotiation till finally the railways agreed and leased them the whole railway. Signals, stations and sidings included. In those years, the line deteriorated fast. Get a couple of guys around this, we'll just lift this over and put it in place. 18 months of slogging, and they're still not even halfway there. Where is it, Mark? Which is the mark? Is it there, is it? Yeah, is it the mark, bro? Yeah. Move it up so this is in the middle of the front. John, what does this machine do? Oh, this uh, straightens the rail. This see where it's been bent by the tree. Yeah, All right. bit, bit We're going to try and uh, straighten this rail without put it in instead of putting a new piece in because we haven't got that many pieces around. How many places are there 
along the track where you're really going to have to do big repair work. There's about 20, 20 really big jobs to do. We've still got about three or four uh, washaways there. But we've got to put the track back in. But generally, do you think you're, you're pretty lucky with this line, or is it in...? Oh, <clears throat> I think if we, we sort of, if we got it from when we started uh, negotiating for it, we, we wouldn't have half the work that we've got to do now. But I mean, we're, we're, there's been a lot of hard, there's not, no luck in it, I don't think, it's just a lot of work. <laughs> How long do you think it'll be before you get it all finished? What, the whole lot, the whole lot from Glenway to Dorigo? Uh, I'd say about 45 years. <laughs> But they're not allowing themselves 45 years. They don't have anything like that amount of time. Time was never a worry in the old days. When steam ran on the line, it used to take five hours for the 43 mile one way trip. They used to say there was plenty of time to admire the scenery. It wasn't just the endless bends and the continuous climbing or the driver's lunch breaks that made the trip so long. There were all the stops at little settlements along the way. Towns like Megan, Cascade, Loanna and Yulong. Places that depended upon the line for trade and communication. For half a century, life centred on the comings and goings of steam. Dorigo, at its furthest extremity, thrived. The remote plateau was in touch with its market. Timber was the mainstay, but at harvest time, whole train loads of potatoes went out. The district stuck to its trains till long after road transports had forced other lines to close. Finally, the decision could be put off no longer. The doors were locked at Dorigo Station. Talk of steam and passengers coming back as people old and young painting and polishing it back to life. It's to be home base for the Duchess and the rest of the massive collection which will take thousands back to the grand old days of steam. Perched on the edge of town, the station is to be at the heart of the place once more. There was an old chap over in the pub one day, he was a bit of a wag, the old fella, but there was a commercial traveller from Sydney there and he said to him, um, how was it, he said, that they come to put the uh, railway station so far away from the town? Oh, he said, I'm buggered if I know, unless it was because they wanted to have it near the railway line. <laughs> <laughs> Can you remember the day that the first train arrived in Dorigo, Pat? Yes, I remember the day the first train arrived here. It must have been a big... I suppose it was, it was, Dorigo it was, was a big day, yes. Yeah, it was in the Christmas holidays, 1923. And, uh, as I say, they put a 18-gallon uh, keg on the people in the town, and the... Uh, Mob got drunk, including the fireman and the driver. And a couple of local blokes drove the train down as far as Megan and left it there for them until they uh, sobered up to take it on. The railway department wouldn't have been real happy if they found out about that. They would not. They wouldn't, wouldn't like to know it, would they? <laughs> they? It was a good service, though, to the area. They, uh, they used to put an, an excursion train from here to Coffs Harbour on New Year's Day. It got well patronised. And they usually had one from Glenroy here for the Dorigo show. So it was really uh, good service, and uh, it was fairly well patronised. How much did the line cost to build, Pat? It cost a pound an inch. That's an awful lot of money. Yeah. God, it's hard to believe. <laughs> yeah. It's hard to believe. Well, that, how that how did what, it cost that much? Well, they reckon that was the right time. Yeah. You think of 700 men, on, they were two years on it. Yeah. 700 men. Yeah. So I wish we had that many people now, we'd uh, be up here already. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All along the line, people are pitching in to bring the old days back. 
horsepower is making up for any lack of manpower. Timber getters, whose jobs once depended upon the line, can replace in a morning a washed out embankment that men armed only with picks and shovels took months to shape. Bert and his mates were there when trains laden with logs and sawn timber trundled down the track each day. Ply for aircraft frames, gum for rifle butts and tent poles, great piles for bridges and the last of the cedar. They still talk of how the trains dominated their lives and moulded their communities. Around about 1922, we were living at Yulong, and I used to sit out before ever I went to school and just watch the blokes working, you know. And I can remember the first time the train emerged out of the scrub, like it was all bush those days, and there she come right through to Yulong with the, you know, they bringing up more rails and things like that. I can remember when we, uh, Dad, bought our first piano. It was a pianola. Well, we've still got it. Uh, it uh, came by rail to Yulong and was put on a bullock wagon and taken to Timsbar, which was two miles along like the road. And I can remember that as a little child, about three years old. It, uh, he used to be a school teacher in Loanna, and uh, he used to ring up for his grog down the Glenray pub. And so as to disguise, to, um, to fool the kids, he used to order a, um, a Rhode Island Red Rooster and a dozen chickens. And the Rhode Island Red Rooster was a bottle of scotch and the dozen chickens was a dozen bottles of beer. <laughs> and that had come up on the train? That had come up on the train, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, was, <clears throat> lots of things did come up on the train. Uh, uh, I can remember talking about uh, something to drink, reminds me of something to eat with the uh, Dave Owen, uh, Waffle, we used to call him, he was half Chinese. He used to come uh, <clears throat> drive the train, drove up to Loanna one day, had his lunch, drove on to Yulong with the train, and then remembered he'd left his lunchbox behind and backed the train right back to Loanna. <laughs> it was only a couple of miles, but he did this. But the thing was about that line in those days that it was uh, just part and parcel of the area, and these things happened, and they, they made a lot of our entertainment. Brings back old memories. Oh, doesn't it? Eh? <laughs> the old memories, eh? The old days. Yeah. The old steam day. Well, uh, Beautiful it's, it's in, in pretty good condition, eh? Yeah, you know, yes, considering, very good condition. Considering in the children's day, eyes, the engine men were heroes. The district had nicknames for them all. Along with what for the firemen, there was Nat Ghoul and the Charger, and Plonko and Radish and Flatbed. The Ragtag Railway was everyone's name for the unruly, unpredictable train service they ran. Schedules were rarely stuck to, and the laws the engineman lived by could not be found in any railways manual. Well, the trouble was there was no control up here, see, yeah, and it. we could work it to suit ourselves, couldn't yeah, we? Yeah, that's right. Mainline blokes like the inspectors and the supers, they knew as long as we done with. our job, they didn't worry us much. They knew what was They knew that we were doing our job properly, we, get, we were getting the work done, and they didn't care much how we done it, so we... That's what we used as long to do. as everything was fair and above board. What was it like to drive a steam loco and train on this line? Lovely. Lovely. I knew every inch of it. Knew if the rabbit went in the wrong burrow. And I, I loved it. And the steam engine up here, but the diesel weren't near as good. I didn't like the diesels as well. You weren't bustled or anything like that. You didn't have control to worry about on the main line. You just worked as you wanted to. Everybody was happy. Yes? Yeah, well, and everybody was happy. Well, I was sorry that it ever closed down myself. When they get it going, I'll, I hope I'm well enough to come up with them and show them a few points about different parts of the line and everything is in our old days, in the old steam engines and everything. I'm sure I can still fire one and drive one too. At first, the idea of a dedicated bunch of amateurs Reopening 60 kilometres of abandoned railway, building a world-class steam museum, and chugging visitors up on their own trains must have sounded like a pipe dream. But in their own quiet, determined way, the steam buffs have proved they mean business. Today, the whole region shares their vision. Each weekend, bodies softened by years behind desks come up for exercise that men before them really did for fun. 
hard manual labour that blistered even the toughest skin. side to Yulong, from Megan through Cascade. There were 700 navvying to get the ragtag laid, and the gangers made the sweat flow, for they held the upper hand, as slowly we moved upward through that drenched and dripping land. Bend your backs and lift that rail, lads, till your spade to make his name. Drive that spike, man, don't just tap it. Admit you're flagging if you're game. And the mountains found an equal in the rough and tumble gangs whose grit and bone and sinews took the ragtag up to range. When they started, much of the line lay broken or buried under a jungle of lantana. One task at a time, it's cleared and the gaps bridged. Dorigo is coming closer. Life between long, strenuous days on the track is lived in a base camp at the foot of the line. OK. It's a junction where past and present meet. These men stick stoically with the past. Lining it up. Lining it up. World War I vintage ambulance cars are their bedrooms. Their kitchens, the cookhouse that served the band who first gave the line its ragtag reputation. What is it about steam that, that you find so special? Oh, well, 
I was a steam enthusiast in the 60s, and when steam finished in the early 70s, I just felt that there was something missing out of my life, like the steam was in my blood. So I joined Keith's Museum, and uh, we've been trying to get this line open because it's such a scenic line, and it'll be just beautiful to see the steam locomotives running up the line again. And Steam affects you oh, that much, you yeah. fellas? It's in the blood, yeah. Once it's in the blood, it's there forever. There to stay. Sounds like an unpleasant condition. <laughs> All the work and hardship up on the line goes on for this. A whole valley of locomotives and rolling stock. Search hard enough and there's probably one of almost everything that ever rolled on rails in Australia. From the very smallest of guards vans, to the oldest of carriages, and the biggest of locomotives. The 260 tonne Garrett. I'll be able to give you a hand with those in a minute. Okay, then I'll get John while I'm down here. Right on. It's only ten years since it all began. Since one ancient engine, destined for the breaker's yard, was saved. They were going to stop at that, then they learnt of another and another, and it snowballed on from there. So far they've paid out over $400,000, and still they search for pieces of Australia's railway past, and feel a compulsion to add them to the enormous collection that's to be put on show. Till everything's safely under cover at Dorigo, it must be protected from further decay. The splattering of sump oil and paint has become an initiation to the club. But it's a price that all are happy to pay to revive the days when life huffed and puffed and rattled to a gentler, more romantic pace. taken some shrewd minds and quick thinking to save an engine like this. The Duchess is one of the few types of locomotive that can handle the steep grades of the Dorigo line. When she finally sets off for that town again, it will be as if nothing has changed. Uh, this locomotive was built in 1902 by Bayer Peacock and Company in England and uh, was purchased by the then New South Wales Government Railways. It's a freight locomotive, hauled freight trains most of its life, and coal trains in the Newcastle area predominantly. I noticed that it's called 5069. What does that mean? Uh, 50 is the class of the locomotive, and it's the 69th locomotive built in that class. So there were, uh, actually there were over 200 very similar locomotives in the 50 class. It's loud, isn't it? It is, <laughs> no doubt. It's got to be to warn the motorists. What makes this locomotive special to you in the museum? It's one of the very few 50 class locomotives that survived until the modern days and uh, it's been unmodified in its condition. It, uh, this class of locomotive uh, at home on the Dorigo line, it was uh, of a type that was common on the Dorigo line for goods trains. The steam locomotive is the nucleus of the museum from my point of view and indeed most of the members uh, almost idolise the steam locomotive. Uh, a lot of people have tried to define what the attraction is but uh, no one's successfully come up with a formula yet. So uh, it's uh, not, not really, a lot of people say, oh, they're big kids, they haven't grown up yet. But I don't know, we've got a, a hell of a lot of big kids if that's the case.
They'll be warming up the boiler. They'll be oiling up the gears. They'll be polishing and painting before the waves and tears. And she'll be cheered through every station and welcomed back once more by the youngsters and the old men who took the ragtag through before. Hear the sound of steam and pistons. Hear the scream of whistles blow. Hear the children and their parents roar as she heads for Dorigo. Thank <laughs> you. 